This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to Asian Insider, a podcast series by The Straits Times. I'm your host, Nirmal Ghosh. And this, by the way, is my 100th episode. Maybe we can have a little round of applause after this. Now, for this modest landmark, today we focus on the relatively voiceless, the relatively forgotten, because they need it more than anyone else does. So today we talk about the ongoing crisis in Myanmar and particularly the Rohingya, a Muslim minority of Myanmar's Rakhine state bordering Bangladesh who have been the target of waves of pogroms over the years in a majoritarian Bamar Buddhist state, Myanmar, run for most of its independent existence by the army. Rohingya today in Rakhine number upwards of half a million. 23 died just the other day when the boat in which they were hoping to reach Malaysia capsized of Rakhine state. Unfortunately, not an uncommon occurrence. Now, more than one million Rohingya, more than one million are in refugee camps in Bangladesh, where they lead a tenuous existence on rations of the last I heard, something like 27 cents a day. Now, I'm really pleased to be joined today by Johannes van der Klau, representative in Bangladesh of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Johannes, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome. And I'm also joined by Richard Halsey, Senior Advisor on Myanmar at the International Crisis Group. Richard, good to, good to see you as well. Thanks for having me on again, Nemo. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Now, Mr. Van der Klau, just how bad is the situation in the camps with the Rohingya and what does the international community need to understand about this crisis? Thank you, Nemo. Um, as you said, um, at the moment, there are some one million Rohingya who live in very congested camps in Bangladesh, in the border zone with Myanmar in the district of Cox's Bazar. Now, first of all, Rohingya have always been there. As you mentioned, there have been waves of uh, persecution and violence in the kind state of Myanmar against the Rohingya since the late 80s. There was a large influx in the 90s, then there was return. There have always been uh, what's now some 40,000, close to 40,000, have been living in Cox Bazaar district since the early 90s. But since this ominous period in 2017, when in one week, in August 2017, over 700,000 Rohingya fled to Cox Bazaar, we now have, as you mentioned, close to 100 one million refugees residing in the camp. This was the single largest influx in a week's time of any refugee group in August 2017. We are getting to the six-year mark of that tragic event. So since then, we have now, um, to be exact, nine, registered 960,000 Rohingya in these camps, 200,000 families, but um, the registration is still ongoing. Um, and they live in 33 extremely congested camps. They're clustered together. It's the largest refugee camp situation in the world globally. I also have to tell you another unique feature of this Rohingya refugee population is that they're also stateless. The Rohingya are also the largest stateless population globally because their country of origin does not accept them as their nationals, as their citizens. We will certainly come back to this. Um, these uh, one million people have been assisted to the best of our abilities over the last years, decades, and particularly since 2017, uh, for which we used to get more or less sufficient humanitarian funding from the international community. That is changing. One of the, the concerns today is that we no longer have the money to assist and to protect this population, um, which have until today been entirely dependent on external humanitarian aid. Because the host government, Bangladesh, considers the presence of the Rohingya in the camps as temporary. All the efforts need to be geared towards return to Myanmar. Hence, they can only live in very fragile bamboo shelters with top line. We are not allowed to build anything more permanent, more sustainable. Also, the interventions have been primarily being of a life-saving and life-sustaining uh, nature. So it's distributing food, uh, for, um, providing health um, facilities, uh, water sanitation, hygiene, of course, 
protection for vulnerable women and children. But um, now that we are in uh, what we call the so-called protracted situation, it's more than six years since the latest influx, this type of refugee situation should become more sustainable from the perspective of the international community. That means that now you need to invest in the refugee self-reliance and resilience. You need to invest in the education, in killing them, in providing them lively opportunities so that they can partially at least access the basic uh, subsistence needs themselves. And this is what they also want to bring the refugees. They don't want to remain dependent on external aid. But the, the, the concerning situation is, and you mentioned it already, the food situation, for instance, we need to cut in the food ration. Uh, they used to have, it was a, we have a very good food system in, in the camps, by the way. We have set up markets and the Ringa have electronic wallets. They used to get $12 a person and during the month they could go to the market. They, they buy the, the products themselves, including fresh vegetables and fruits and so on. But this is now having to reduce this a third to $8 a month per person. And for this, they can no longer buy anything else than just the rice and the cooking oil and some chili. Nothing else anymore. And it's also very challenging for families to put three meals on the table anymore. That's no longer possible because you mentioned the figure. They now have 27 cents a day, uh, nine cents if they would still serve three meals a day. An egg is even more than nine cents. So families are uh, struggling. They have no longer enough in the electronic wallet to carry throughout the month. So you see they develop uh, what we call negative coping mechanisms. They risk to take their children out of school to start working. Um, they, uh, you see already the nutrition uh, rate of, of the children, the malnutrition, the acute, acute malnutrition rising. You get, of course, problematic health conditions. People start again taking the boats, etc. So this situation of being underfunded as an operation, uh, coupled with um, the, the living conditions uh, deteriorating of the refugees, and then uh, the rising insecurity in the camp. Um, this used to be, you know, one million people, there are always issues of criminality, mm -hmm. etc. But nowadays we see these, what we call armed groups, uh, from across the border, they saw chaos and mayhem in the camps. They're coupled with organized crime. This is a border area, traditionally always the scene of trafficking of drugs, people, all kinds of goods. Um, and then gang violence. And you see that there are more and more killings in the camps, uh, abductions. Um, you see that there are kidnappings. And then, of course, we call on the law enforcement in Bangladesh, because they are responsible for the safety and security of the refugees, to really patrol uh, in an effective and timely manner. But mm. we have challenges here. Um, mm. So all this together creates a situation of instability, uh, um, degrading living conditions. At the moment, as we speak, if you go to the camps now, you still see a large uh, segment of services quality services, um, a lot of um, involvement of the refugees themselves. They work as volunteers, as teachers, as health workers, etc. But all this should no longer be taken for granted. Whether that is still there next year, if we don't get the funding, uh, we are really in serious trouble. Very alarming situation, I have to say. Um, Richard, may, if I could come to you now, uh, and for a slightly broader context, I think it was Thant Mint U who wrote once that you can't fix Rakhine if you don't fix Myanmar. So this has to be seen in that context, a country in deep crisis, civil war, over 2,000 civilians killed, over 1 million people internally displaced. Against this background, is there any hope for the Rohingya? I mean, I think for the Rohingya, both in Myanmar and those who fled to Bangladesh, the military coup of 2021 was, was a terrible situation for them and destroyed their hopes of going home in the future because you had the architect of their expulsion, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, General Min Aung Hlaing. He was the one who did the coup. He took power in the country. He's still two and a half years on in control of the country. And how can you imagine as a Rohingya to go back to a country that is now under the iron grip and very violent iron grip 
of the architect of your expulsion. So I think there's that psychological factor, that political factor as well. But in practice as well, it's really hard to see how you could return Rohingya uh, voluntarily, uh, safely, uh, and in dignity to Rakhine State while it is in such a precarious situation. Rakhine State hasn't been as affected as other parts of Myanmar by the post-coup violence. You don't have a strong resistance force there. The Arakan army has maintained a fragile ceasefire with the national uh, army. Uh, but how long will that continue? It's a very uncertain situation. The Arakan army and the military regime are on completely different tracks. You know, the Arakan army is using this period of, of post-coup turmoil in Myanmar to pursue its own objective, which is to more tightly control Rakhine State, especially the central and northern parts, with a view to having a kind of independence in the future, or at least a, a quasi-independence in, in, in actual fact. And this is something which the Myanmar military has felt they can't challenge right now because they've got too many other issues on their plate. They're fighting wars all across Myanmar. But certainly the idea of a Rakhine homeland controlled by the Arakan army is anathema to the generals. They will not allow a critical piece of Myanmar's geography to, to kind of seed off and become a, a quasi-independent enclave in the same way as you have in Shan State with the Wa. This is something they cannot accept. Uh, and, and so, you know, we're on a path that at some point, soon or later, will lead to renewed heavy conflict in Myanmar. So that, that's a situation where you can't have a sustainable return. The policies uh, of, the, of the Myanmar regime are not amenable to a sustainable, dignified return. They haven't changed the principle that the Rohingya are illegals who have to prove their right to remain in Myanmar or come back to Myanmar as kind of glorified visitors. They're not talking about a meaningful pathway to citizenship or, you know, the ability to live permanently uh, in Myanmar. That's not really on the table. Um, and so any return would just place the Rohingya back in the kind of situation they were in before 2017, uh, which, which, wasn't, uh, which wasn't sustainable uh, and, and didn't respect their rights. Um, the social situation has definitely improved in Rakhine State. The com intercommunal relations between Rakhine and Rohingya communities are much better today than they were in 2017 and very much better than they were in 2012 when we saw the real intense intercommunal violence. But we have to remember that this comes against a backdrop in which, you know, three, three quarters of a million Rohingya have moved to Bangladesh. It's much easier to be accepting of the Rohingya when there's three quarters of a million less of them. I think if there was a prospect of large scale return, that would really test the community acceptance of the Rohingya by, by the Rakhine. And while today that seems you know, much, much better, I think we do have to worry about what that picture would look like if there were a large-scale return. And, and it may not remain the same. It will become a political issue again, a hot-button political issue for the Rakhine in a way that it's not today. And so I really do think that the international community, the government of Bangladesh, you know, everyone needs to be thinking about what happens if return is not in practice you know, going to be an option for many people? Of course, it has to be the first option. Of course, everything has to be done to allow the Rohingya to go home. But if they can't, what then? And I think you know, there needs to be more recognition of this because the, the situation that Johannes described of donor fatigue, mm -hmm. of reduction in resources, we can see this continuing and getting worse in the future not only because the Rohingya are increasingly dropping off the international kind of consciousness, not only as Myanmar is also a pretty low priority, to be honest, internationally, uh, with other crises and, 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 and so on. You know, that is a recipe for, 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 for less resources, for more difficulty in mobilizing resources. As that happens, the government of Bangladesh is, is going to say rightfully, you know, why should we be left with the sole responsibility uh, of, of, of taking care of this huge, huge caseload. And so they're going to respond in a political way, which will be, you know, the risk being that they will put more restrictions on the Rohingya rather than allowing the kind of sustainable living uh, that's needed, the education, the healthcare, the investment in livelihoods and futures. That's much harder when, when Bangladesh mm -hmm. is feeling that, you know, 
the world has has deserted it. So we have a really toxic situation here. And you know, I think the broader region has a responsibility as well. There are many Rohingya people living across the region, whether it's in the Gulf countries, whether it's in Malaysia, uh, other other places. Uh, those populations have not mm-hmm. been regularized either. Those governments have not followed through on, uh, on, on their moral responsibility to say, okay, these people can't go back to Myanmar. They may have come from Bangladesh, from the refugee case, so it's not feasible for them to go back there either. We have to think about what we do for those populations. And that's a topic that is very rarely heard discussed, to be, you know, uh, but is a very, very important mm-hmm. one as well. So you know, there needs to be more global thinking about how we address this. And that has to partly be third country resettlement. It has to be a focus on uh, the the right and and ability to return to Myanmar, if at all possible. And there has to be some local uh, integration element of that. But how you put that together, uh, that's really the challenge that that Johannes and and UNHCR and and others on the ground in Bangladesh have been grappling with these last years. And uh, and, and, yeah, I I think it's an extraordinarily Mm. difficult policy challenge. Uh, Johannes, um, what is the status of moves, if any, of um, to you know repatri- repatriate Rohingya to uh, Rakhine State? Is that even feasible? And do they want to go back, or do they prefer resettlement in a third country? Um, thank you. Yeah, um, at the moment there are no moves. There is discussion about small pilots of Rohingya possibly returning to some very well identified location. Um, Because as Richard said, conditions in Rakhine State in Myanmar are not conducive to any sustainable safe return. We all know that. Um, But at the same time, if individual refugees want to exercise the right to return, and if they think that in general, larger scale return is not possible to their area of origin, but if they think they can go back because their village has remained intact, they still have family living there, they can resume their livelihoods and uh, access to services, who are we then to deprive them of that right? However, if they consider that, they need to make such a decision based on all the information available, they need to know exactly what they go back to. Um, They need to be counseled by us. And we also need to assess whether such a decision is taken totally voluntarily without any coercion. So um, we have seen that for the first time, the uh, de facto authorities in Myanmar have engaged in a discussion of potential pilots of return. That's it for the first time. They were never, ever interested. Mm. And they've been discussing and have proposed a, 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 a group to return, but then they said they should return to some model villages they have been building. But any potential return is a matter between the two countries, and they've concluded an arrangement for that to happen in the future already way back in November 2017, a few months after the latest influx, but in that bilateral agreement, they have clearly stipulated that if there would be any return in the future, it would be to places of origin, or if these places are no longer existing, being burned down, etc., to places of choice of the refugees. And so when we had these recent discussions between the two countries of a potential return to places of model villages created by, by the story, and the refugees even went on a so-called go and see visit there, and there was a so-called come and tell visit of a delegation from Myanmar to the camps to explain this, they said, look, this is not an area of choice of us. So they were not interested to go back there, because they only would like to go back if they go back in a situation where they can reclaim the property, the housing, the lands, and the livelihoods, etc. So that it was not the case in this previous pilot. Plus, of course, the fundamental issue, it's not just in terms of return situations, what you see in operational terms, are the services functioning? Can I get back to my life? Are my rights reinstituted? Do I have a pathway to citizenship? Do I have freedom of movement, etc.? And these are fundamental questions which are still open. Uh, now, there is another discussion about the potential return then to places of origin, but it's all still under discussion. 
this is a discussion between the two countries. Um, UNHCR is not involved in these technical discussions, but if they would prepare for a return, then we have a mandate to assess at the Bangladesh side whether any decisions individual by taken is free and informed, and we need to counsel. And at the receiving end in Myanmar, we must be present to monitor that any potential return is, is happening in safety and that any reintegration following that return is sustainable. And that again, that's the whole, the package of rights, to, are the people then able to have unfettered access to housing, land, potential property, uh, livelihood opportunities, services, going to school, medical services, but also again, have a pathway to future citizenship and the citizenship they require, the full citizenship. So it's being discussed, um, but whether it will happen remains to be seen. And again, this is at the background where any size of return is not possible because the conditions in general are just not conducive to return. So only yeah. in very individual cases of certain areas, certain identified villages. And if this is to happen, it should be the entire family from the camps. It should not be resulted into splitting families and very decisively identified pockets of villages where everything is still intact and safe. Hard, yeah, hard to see an optimistic picture for them if they, uh, you know, even if they want to return. Now, Richard, last quick one for you, um, if I may. Post-monsoon, well, the monsoon is on now, post-monsoon soon. Do you expect to see more Rohingya departing, um, Rakhine State in particular, on that horribly risky voyage across the Bay of Bengal? And has ASEAN come up with any strategic thinking on how to deal with this running problem? I do expect uh, more boats to take off from the camps in Bangladesh and from Rakhine State. I also expect more people to leave from Rakhine State and from the camps and try to cross by land across Myanmar to get to Thailand and then on to Malaysia. That route is also extremely risky for different reasons than the sea route, but also one that a lot of people, increasing number of people, are using. And you know, the issue here is yes, of course, there can be you know better work done on saving lives at sea on you know, preventing the terrible deaths we see. But unless you address the root of the problem, people are going to t keep on making the decisions, the difficult decisions to embark on these dangerous journeys. And why is that? I mean, it's because life in the camps in Bangladesh is becoming more and more intolerable for the reasons that Johannes spoke about. The food ration is low, mm -hmm. the violence in the camps. If people have children, male children especially, you know, they're going to wind up being members of the armed gangs or victimized by the armed gangs. So life you know, is terrible and, and they don't see a positive future. And so, you know, the more uh, Bangladesh cracks down on this, the more the global community uh, commits less resources, the harder life gets. And then other options, whether it's return for some to Myanmar, to terrible conditions in Myanmar, or dangerous gambles to, to reach other countries, those will seem better than continued life in the camp. Yeah, that's the unfortunate reality. Well, Richard Horsey, Johannes van der Klau, thank you very much for joining me on Asian Insider. That nicely wraps this discussion up for the Asian Insider podcast. I'm your host, Nirmal Ghosh. Join me and my expert guests for the next episode on the fourth Friday of every month. That was a podcast by The Straits Times. Send your feedback to podcast at sph.com.sg. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. For more podcasts by The Straits Times, The Business Times, and Money FM 89.3, you can also download the audio by SPH app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O.